Hello and welcome to Yalla, the podcast for Jewish students brought to you by UJS. I'm Alison, Social Action and Interfaith SAB at UJS. And I'm Svi, Ex-Education Officer at Elise JSOC. And today we're privileged to have Elisa Ben Shalom join us on the podcast. Elisa is a matchmaker and relationship coach, best known for being the star of hit Netflix show, Jewish Matchmaking. Elisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Tell us briefly about your upbringing and how you got into matchmaking. I, right. So matchmaking is not a thing. <laughs> There's like, unless it's in your genes and uh, within a family uh, dynasty of matchmakers. But um, I got into matchmaking, I think, very organically and casually. I always tried to set friends up. Um, I was always the, the go-between and trying to... Uh, make things work. And then after I got married, I was looking for something to do within the community that was more flexible with time where it wouldn't be um, a job that I had to, you know, wake up and go to so I could be home with my kids. And my girlfriend's like, oh, I, you know, I do this matchmaking thing online. And I was like, oh, I can do that. Can you do it from home? Can I do it when the kids take a nap? She's like, yeah, no problem. And so I got started as a volunteer matchmaker and I fell in love with matchmaking and then coaching and then training matchmakers, which ultimately led to having a, a program and uh, being able to, to inspire a lot of people. And talking more specifically about your career, are there any tough challenges that you've had to face? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think working with um, all different types of people from all different types of backgrounds, it takes a skill and an ability to really understand people, listen, take them in, and to be able to navigate gracefully. Um, oftentimes we see people have you know like rigid thinking or they're stuck in their own way and and as a matchmaker and as a coach I'm, my goal is to guide them through the process help them to get what they need and help them to also find who they want and hopefully those two things can match up together but I think it's often a challenge to to combat are you a matchmaker and are you setting me up or are you coaching me and walking me through this? And, and how do those two things integrate? That's usually the greatest challenge. Amazing. Um, like, obviously, we've watched your program on Netflix. It's just amazing. Um, and I'm sure we've got so many other stories. Um, what was the most standout story for you from, you know, from your career? Oh, for my whole career? <laughs> Ooh, what a question. What a question. Um, you know, I was recently in Philadelphia and visiting um, somebody who became a good friend of mine, but I met her because of matchmaking. And um, she started dating and she had really connected with somebody who was about seven years younger than she was. And, uh, you know, in matchmaking, it's much more common for the man to be older than the woman. That's just kind of the way that it is. Um, or the same age, but really to have somebody, you know, two years younger, four years younger, but seven years younger is a significant age gap. And um, she and I worked together to help them to, you know, kind of meet because they were in a similar community and in the same area, but then to also help the match to get set up. And it's such a blessing to see them. They're married. They have a couple kids um, and a dog and, and such a beautiful life. And I think it goes to show that even though something might not be standard or normal or what, you know, everybody does or how it's done, if it's your match, if it's your person, it's going to be something that works out. And I've just got to follow up on that. I'm so curious. How many weddings do you go to? <laughs> Is it like oh one of the Oh, so when I first started in this business, I would tell my husband, I'm like, oh, I got to go. I have a, you know, a client wedding. I've got to run. And I would run. I ran. I we used to live in Philadelphia. I ran from Philly to New York. I went to Baltimore. <laughs> I went, you know, if I could drive there and it was fairly easy, I would go. We had a lot of small kids, so I didn't usually fly out to the weddings, but I've been to, I don't know, I probably can't even count how many weddings, <laughs> but now it's harder now for me to go. I, whenever I get to go, I feel so blessed. Um, but I, I'm not able to attend everybody's wedding, but when I do get to go, it's really like, incredible. And tell us more specifically, how did the Netflix show come about? Yeah. So I don't know if you guys heard of Indian matchmaking, 
but it was a huge success. And Netflix was open to doing kind of like a sister show and a spinoff. And the producer said, let's do Jewish matchmaking. And the and Netflix was like, cool, find us a Jewish matchmaker. So they went on a casting call to find a Jewish matchmaker. And then after that, they, I mean, I did a lot of interviews and so did a lot of my colleagues. And, and then they came back and said, great, we pick you and we're moving ahead. And they greenlit the show and uh, got us to production. It was a whole process though. It was like interviewing and a year later signing a contract and, you know, nine months later starting the program. And then a year after that, everything actually launching. So I knew about this since 2020 and it came to fruition now in 2023. It, it uh, came out May of 2023. So can I guess ask, even before 2020, was running a matchmaking show something that you always wanted to do or something that you just saw the opportunity and thought that it'd be a good one to take? No, I was actually exploring a different show and a different opportunity. And um, I, I kind of like God and I talk all the time and I'm like, listen, I'm going to do something and I want to do something big and I want to do something really important and really good for the Jewish people. And like you pick the opportunity and I was weighing these two options. And this one to me seemed like the more significant and the much more impactful program. Um, and I'm really grateful that it came about. Amazing. And like, what was it? What was it like being on a TV program? I mean, like being the star of a show that's such like an amazing opportunity to have. Like, what was what was like a day to day like for you? So, um, I had mostly half days as opposed to like a full day of shooting. So they would shoot other things, let's say in the morning and then sometime mid afternoon, it would be hair and makeup and then go to the set. It wasn't a set. It was usually somebody's home or a coffee shop or wherever we went. And uh, I'd be there for a couple hours. We'd do filming and and then be done. But like literally I walked in, they're like, okay, let's get you mic'd up. And they put a mic, you know, on you and um, hook you all up. And then there's no lines, there's no anything. So it's like, okay, so whatever you normally do when you meet people, that's what you're going to do. And I was like, for real? They're like, yeah. Like, I'm like, you don't even know what I do. <laughs> like you, you hired me to do something. You really don't know who I am. You really don't know what I do in my process. They're like, right, but we'll learn. Go ahead, just do it. And we're going to film it. And that's what happened. So I walked in actually to Harmony's house and uh, she was the first person I met. And I was like, oh, like normally I would have my computer or something, but like, I don't want to use a computer. I, I sometimes use a notebook. I was like, but I don't have a notebook with me. I don't like, I don't know. I got busy packing and thinking about everything else. She's like, don't worry. I've got a notebook for you. So she gave me a notebook. And then one of the producers gave me a pen. You see me writing with this gorgeous gold pen. They gave me this beautiful gold pen and uh, like a fountain pen. And then I started taking my notes and doing everything that I normally do. But it was just, I people ask me like, did you feel weird? Did you feel uncomfortable? I really didn't. I don't know. I, I wasn't asked to be or to do anything other than who I am. And I'm very good at being me, right? If you ask me to come on and be an actress and do a whole dramatic scene, I don't know that I could do that. But if I would feel that way, and if it would be me, then I could do that because I'm very good at being me. So I just had to be me. And it was, it was actually very unusually comfortable for me like yeah there were cameras and after like five minutes you forget that they're there and you have to focus like really hard on being present and uh you know having good power oh, I was very hyper focused about posture you know because like sometimes you sit and you lounge and you slouch and um and for me I was like you know I, I wanted to make sure that I really you know you, you have to like act okay look okay be okay there's so many like Thoughts so many things parts. on your head at once. Yeah. Thoughts, you're matchmaking. Um, so, I mean, I'm curious. Um, who was your favorite couple on the show? Or, like, just the, I don't know, like, your favorite match? Or, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I've heard from all the responses is that um, Shia and Faye, who were the more traditional couple, the more observant couple, they, you could just see they had such a good time together. They were so relaxed and so comfortable with one another and people were really rooting for them. Um, that was a couple that really kind of like struck. And also um, Nikisha, when she had her date at the selfie museum and it, the two of them just were like a little bit like just sparkly. I, 
every couple, you know, I always, I'm excited to see every couple, even Uri, um, the one who wanted blonde hair, blue eyes. And the second person I set him up with, he was like, Oh, he was like, I could see he was actually nervous on camera because he was so excited about the match. But I don't know. I really get excited about all couples. I don't, you know, like, you know, you're not supposed to pick favorites with your children. I think also with your matches, like it's not favorites. <laughs> Um, and what would you say the main differences are between matchmaking in America and matchmaking in Israel? So in Israel, matchmaking starts, I would say, much younger, even secular, whether you're religious or secular, it doesn't matter. People are hyper focused on family here and matchmaking. It's not unusual for even not matchmaking, just you know, coupling up to happen at a much younger age and for marriage to happen at a much younger age. So that's one of the large differences. I think that families are more involved in Israel than they are across the globe. Uh, maybe even Israelis, you could see also on the show, you know, with some Israeli parents that were just like, oh, wow, you're really involved in this process. It's a family affair. It's not just up to the single. It's also how we integrate with our entire family. So I think that family is really important. And I think that in America, people um, hyper-focus on career. And career is very, very big. In, in Israel, the army is big, right? You go to the army after high school, that's what you do. Career, whatever, you know, university, whatever. But army is like the same level as, as what people consider university. But even in the army, people are looking to find their person and to be with somebody. Whereas in university, a lot of times in America, people are just like, yeah, whatever. Just have a boyfriend, girlfriend. Like if it happens, when it happens, they're not as hyper-focused on finding the one. Can I just ask a very quick follow up on that? You were mentioning about families being involved in certain capacities. Do you ever have cases where what your client wants is perhaps diff slightly different to what one of the parents might want for them? Yes, 100%. And I'm very big into figuring out what the single wants for themselves and how they will help that person to integrate with their family. Because the family doesn't, the family will be involved, but they're not married to them, living with them every single day, day in and day out. So to me, it's most important that the person that's going to be living with this person is satisfied and that they find somebody that they're really, they're into, that they enjoy being with, that they want to spend their life with. And I mean, the question on all our minds is, will there be a series two? So TBD, we don't uh, have any updates on that yet, but we are praying that there's going to be more amazing matchmaking stuff coming, whether it's that or something even better. Uh, yeah, we're, we're all praying for uh, the next thing. Amazing. I'm looking forward to it regardless. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's the process from when one of your clients first contacts you to when they start getting matched up? So with us, we do like an intake. We will learn all about them, understand who they are, understand what they're looking for. We create a dating profile for them, like a unique one pager with photos and a bio and a little bit about them so that we understand who they are and that we can explain that to other people. And then we go on a, a search basically, and we search everywhere, high and low. We will search online. We will search through our matchmaking networks, through any of our social channels, any of our friends. And we will do our best to kind of filter in all of the right matches. We, anybody who's a potential match, we will interview and get to know them. We do background checks on them to make sure that there's nothing that we need to know that we don't yet know. And, um, and then we would set them up uh, potentially on a date. Well, we would actually ask our client, are you interested? And if they were interested, we would set them up on a date and uh, hope for the best. And what's a sign that a couple will last? That's a good question. I think that a couple that is aligned in their values, in what they're looking for, in their personality, that is very good. A couple that knows how to laugh together and enjoy their time together so that everything isn't like super intense and super serious. That's another piece of it that's really good. And having similar goals, like knowing that we're heading in a similar direction, even if we're not going at the same pace and the same speed, as long as we're heading in the same direction, then then things are going to be in a good place. And lastly, also that the things that like any of my fears or triggers that you as another person don't 
trigger that to a high degree. It'll trigger it, but I can handle it. Not that it's an overwhelming um, trigger between the two of us. And if one of your, if someone else who you know is a matchmaker has somebody who you think might be suitable for one of your clients, how do you find out about the other person? Do you have some sort of database that you have access to before, or do you go to them after you meet your client and think that they need someone? So uh, with our own, with matchmakers kind of in this world, we collaborate, we have WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups, and we're always posting, here's a client that we're in search of. If you have anybody in your database, let us know. And um, in that way, matchmakers collaborate with each other, in addition to sourcing people from um, other locations, databases, friends of friends, like we do grassroots matchmaking and we call people and we talk to them and we do database searches and we do collaborative efforts with other matchmakers as well. And everybody loves to work together. Like we're, it's a, it's a collaborative industry. It's not like a competitive industry. Amazing. I guess you all have like the same common goal of just, yeah, right. just together. get them married, just help <laughs> them find the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a bit curious about like the challenges as well. So, I mean, from the show, you've seen that you set up people from different denominations. Um, yeah. So like, what is the different challenges that come from setting up people from different denominations? I think really understanding somebody's background is one of the greatest challenges to make sure that if I'm going to be the one to set you up, that I know you at a core level, that I understand where you came from, that I understand the type of life and family that you want to build. And if I didn't come from that background, then I kind of have to do my homework and be a little bit of a researcher, you know, a sociologist, anthropologist, something like where I put on a different hat and I get to know you from an intimate level of how you grew up and what type of a background and family you're from and how to find somebody that's going to match with that. We don't always find the exact match, like somebody who's from a similar background, but sometimes it's a different background, but it's close enough and we understand each other. Or sometimes one side's very flexible and it's like, oh, I love these customs. I could take on your customs. So um, one of the greatest challenges is just making sure that we really understand people so that we can best help them. And have you ever matched a couple either deliberately or accidentally who have met before, perhaps in a different context? Yes. I call that mystery in your history. <laughs> <laughs> when people meet a mystery from their history and somebody from the past, uh, I actually love it because when they know each other, there's often, look, sometimes it's hard to overcome the, I know you already. But at the same time, there's a certain level of comfort. So there's like a there's like a yay boo. It's like, oh, you, you're comfortable with each other. Oh, but you think you're just better as friends. Oh, but maybe you should date. So for me, I have them go out to a nice restaurant, something a little fancier, dress a little nicer so I don't just look like my everyday clothes, like the person that you're used to seeing so that you can see me at my best and you can see me in a different context. And then maybe you can consider me not just as a friend, but as somebody who could be a romantic partner. So I try to change it up a little bit. These are actually my favorite matches to make, like favorite, 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 because to me, they have so much more potential than introducing somebody to a complete stranger that has no history and no accountability and, and nothing there that glues them together. At least if they've known each other from before, usually there's there's a base there that helps us to get to the next level. Um, okay, so what has your experience been like being uh, Jewish in the public eye, especially with everything that's been going on in the past few months? So in the beginning, you know, October 8th, I flew out to America to do a tour and I was very nervous and uncomfortable. And I was in the States and also in London. Um, London was actually much scarier than the States. It was not super comfortable as, as a woman, as opposed to a religious man, right? With a religious man, maybe you're going to see a yarmulke, maybe they're going to dress a certain way that's going to tip you off. But as a religious Jewish woman in uh, cooler weather, so to wear, you know, longer clothing, uh, people don't notice as much. To wear a wig, if you don't know, you don't know. I tried not to walk around with my scarf or my head wrap um, just because I don't know what people are thinking and I'm looking to just kind of <laughs> get in, get out, do my work and not have any problems. But 
internally, I felt uncomfortable. Externally, you know, I did actually remember now once I did, I was like, it was going to be a long flight. And I put on my scarf instead of wearing my wig because it's much more comfortable. And I did get one of like a really nasty look at the airport. And I just thought, okay, let it just be a look. Please don't come near me. Please don't talk to me. Please don't <laughs> do anything. Just let it just be a nasty look. Um, and I kept walking quickly to my gate. But there's an amount of discomfort and there's an amount of fear of the unknown and you hear crazy stories. And so you just don't know what's going to happen. So I, it hasn't been super comfortable, but I believe in the work that I'm doing. And I think that I need to reach the world and to help the world in the way that I can. And so I'm going to do it, even if I'm not feeling the most comfortable. And like, how does that translate into being Jewish online? What's your experience then? Yeah. So on, I mean, listen, I'm the Jewish matchmaker, like <laughs> Netflix made a show called Jewish matchmaking. And now it's Aliza, the Jewish matchmaker. I'm not a matchmaker. I'm the Jewish matchmaker. So online, I kind of, I don't know if the word is, uh, I maybe I would say accepted that like, you don't really hide. Like in the world, I could walk around and uh, people still recognize me and they know me, Jewish, not Jewish. If they watch the show, they're like, oh, Aliza. So they know me, but but online, you can't really hide. And I have posted some things about Judaism and Jews. And I do stand up at programs and I say, I stand with Israel, we stand with Israel. And I put that on my social media. We lost probably 5,000 followers because of the Jewish stuff, which I'm very happy to lose people that are not um, loving Israel and loving the Jewish people. So that's perfectly fine with me. But you know, we, we, and we get also anti-Jewish comments and, um, we're trying to navigate it gracefully. And I will also say play the game, meaning sometimes really negative comments actually boost the visibility of the post. And so some really negative things, my social media person told me, she's like, Aliza, I'm aware. Just leave it there. We're leaving it there for about 48 hours. Watch what happens. And then the numbers go up and I'm like, right, but do you want, I don't know who's seeing this. She goes, leave it. It's good for the world. Just leave it. And so I'm, I'm trusting her and we've been doing that. So I haven't been hiding it all online. And um, I think that it's the right thing to do. Just be who you are, share who you are, share the information and, you know, delete stuff when you should. <laughs> and very vague question, but is there any dating advice you would give to Jewish students? Yes. Okay. This is very, 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 very important. You will get a degree. Okay. You will graduate. You will get a degree. Fine. Don't leave until you get a spouse. Don't leave. Find your person. When you leave university, you have far fewer options. Where are you going to go to find them? You're going to go hang out at a bar. You're going to go to a party that your friend makes. How easy is it going to be to meet people? Right now you can join groups. You can be a part of things. You have like dozens and dozens or hundreds of people that you could potentially meet depending on what campus you're on and once you leave university the numbers go from large to tiny and you're like oh but I thought I would just meet somebody after I graduated when I was working where in your office with like four other people you know like it's you do not have as many options and also meeting somebody at a younger age and growing together is so wonderful. And a lot of people are like, oh, but I have to make money. And before, the yeah, great. You're going to make money. What are you going to do with it? You won't have a family. Where are you going to find the person? Ask everybody who's single post-college where they find people. It is very difficult. Everybody's on apps and online and in social media groups and whatever. And it is so much easier. So just stay in school until you find your spouse. And I'm sorry to the parents who have to pay for more college because you are <laughs> looking for your spouse, but just keep getting degrees until you find the one. That's my advice. And so you touched briefly on dating apps. Like what's your opinion on them? And I guess how, what's that, the attitudes change towards dating? So I guess what's your opinion on that? So I think that dating apps are like mini matchmakers. They give you options. You have a huge database, but you have to be the matchmaker. So that's like, you know, a, a, a database and a system for you to use, but you have to be the expert. So 
I like it as like in general, I like it if you use it properly. So in the same way that you would go to a class and do well and study hard and get a good grade, if you don't do well, study hard, you'll never find a person on the apps because you might be doing it all wrong. So the photos, yes, you do need to have good photos. Sorry, if it's online, it's visual. You do need to have a decent write-up that quickly in one sentence can say something like amazing that makes me want to actually say, hey, and contact you. And if you can't think of what to do, your generation, which is different than mine, just use chat GPT. People are also, they're like anti, it's AI, that. I don't really care. You can put in there, like, act as a single person in their 20s in university and write uh, a quick three-line dating profile because I like X, Y, and Z and fill in the blank and make sure that it's bubbly and outgoing. Make sure it's serious and blah, blah. Like, literally put in the emotion of whatever you want. It will read your mind and spit out something amazing. I put something in there about um, and make the profile like a little bit spicy. You know, this person's from Latin America, so I need this to be a spicy profile. I am telling you with emojis and everything, the whole thing was incredible. And then pull one or two lines from it that you like, throw it online and you have something amazing. And it took you, what, three minutes to do? It's not like you have to sit there and like, you know, break your head over this, trying to figure out what you should say, but you have dating apps. And if you're looking for somebody also just be clear, like if you just want to date, say, I just want to date. If you're serious and you want a relationship, say I'm looking for a relationship. And if you just want to have fun, say, I'm just looking to party. You want to, you want to hang with me. Like that's it. Just, just call out who you are and what you want to do. And I guess just like touching on something that from early about what makes a sign of a good couple what are some red flags that you know people should like look out for that maybe it's not the one um if you have one of those love hate relationships like oh we love each other but like we just fight a lot but like it's okay because we really love each other I don't care you're never going to be able to stay happily and healthfully married you love each other good guess what love is not enough so break up and move on. We need relationships that are a little bit more emotionally stable and healthy with people who support and care for each other and loving each other is good. But if you fight, like either learn how to fight fair. Um, there's a book about nonviolent communication, learn how to communicate better and um, don't stick in a relationship also where somebody puts you down or is negative towards you or isn't supportive and think like, oh, well, they'll get better. Or, I don't mind. I don't need to be supported. You know, words of affirmation don't matter to me. It does matter after hearing it over and over again. So pick happy, healthy humans and don't date people, even if you love them, but they're wrong. Um, when you set people up, maybe from different states, which can be quite far away from each other, do you find that people are generally happy to have some sort of long distance relationship until they decide whether that's the one or do people generally try to stick to a closer proximity? People usually start local and then if they cannot find what they want or not enough of, of what they're looking for, then they're open to long distance. But you really have to be in it for the long haul. And I like that people see each other every three weeks, you know, for a weekend or, or several days, maybe every four weeks. It's very hard for a long distance relationship to be maintained where you don't see each other for two months at a time. It's not, it's not healthy and ideal because I don't really know you. You don't really know me. We have a virtual relationship. And then when we meet in person, does it really work or doesn't it work? I don't know. Cause we haven't spent enough time together. So, um, I find that people are open to long distance relationships, but they should do it properly. And they do need to make a commitment of traveling to see each other, what I would consider often, like on a monthly basis. And when people, um, when you set a couple up, for example, at what point do they stop reporting back to you after each date? So for example, after date six, will they still come back to you and say what they think? Or is there a point where you sort of leave them? It depends on the person. So sometimes some people are like, look, we're good. We got this. You know, if I need you, I'll call you. And sometimes people will say, no, I just need you. Like I'm an anxious dater and I just need to, I need the support of what's, you know, of what you offer. And I want you to guide me through this a little bit longer, but I would say, right after date five, six, if we have a good connection, then 
it might, they might be less likely to come back. Like if a couple has a good connection, they might be less likely to come back just because they're kind of good and they're, they're on a good page. And then they might check in on a monthly basis instead of on a weekly basis. And what do you usually recommend as like the ideal first date for people you set up? Uh, so I love that people have the ability to talk. So it could be just a coffee date or something that's not heavily invested. I don't need somebody to have a whole meal, but other people, they don't like to sit and they like get fidgety. So sometimes they like to do an activity. So anything, whether you're walking around a mall or you go mini golfing or you do some small activity, um, those can be good. I don't recommend super long dinner dates because well, we don't need to spend a lot of time or a lot of money if I don't even know if I like you. And I don't recommend things like hanging out or watching a movie or something where there's no talking involved. Like you, you actually have to have a place where you can have a conversation and not something that's super noisy. Like don't go to like, I don't know, Dave and Buster's or, you know, an arcade place where it's like really loud and we can't really have a conversation through the activity. Amazing. And we're just going to wrap up with a few quick fire questions. Okay. Um, first of all, who's your biggest role model? Oh, so I would say that my parents, my mom passed away almost eight years ago, but my parents were married uh, since they were in their early 20s, over 40 years, and um, they really worked hard to build a healthy marriage. Um my grandparents are all on both sides were also married. My in-laws have been married over 60 years. And I just think that family, seeing family live together and love each other and build relationships through the ups, through the down, through the challenges, you know, like they say in sickness and health, right? So seeing that happen to me is the most inspiring, the most inspiring thing. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um if you weren't a matchmaker, what would you be doing? Right. I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And when I went to college, I got a degree in interdisciplinary studies, which means nothing. <laughs> it just means I went to college and I designed my own major. I had a certificate in Jewish studies and one in children's literature and one in public policy and the environment. That was like my three-part um, degree. I always wanted to write books, which I am doing as well. Um but I, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Like I had no career aspirations. I wanted to be married. I wanted a husband and I wanted children. That was my life goal. And now that I did that, I'm like, now I want everybody to get married and have a family and, and build it um, in the way that they need to. So maybe I'd be a writer. I don't know. I love, I mean, I love every part of my job. I write, I tour, I do speaking engagements. I create programs and content and online things. And I love everything. So I probably would take one of those areas or many of them and do that. But I, I don't know what my topic would be if it wasn't, I, I would, you know what, hold on. I, I talked enough that I figured it out. I love building businesses. So I would probably do exactly what I'm doing, but with business and career coaching, which I kind of do on the side, but nobody knows. Now they know, but I do that like hush hush. And I've helped a bunch of people build businesses. And because I built my business and this is the only business I ever want to continue to build, I still have that desire to build businesses. So I keep helping friends to build their businesses. So that's probably what I do. And um, what is your favorite Jewish food? Oh my gosh, my favorite Jewish food. The hardest question. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I love all my Jewish foods. Um, a, a good kosher pickle. My husband now makes homemade pickles, like half sour. That's what we like. A half sour kosher pickle. I've never tried that before. <laughs> <laughs> they're fabulous. If they're full sour, I'm not into it. But half sour is perfect. They're kind of still like a cucumber with flavor as opposed to like a pickle pickle. I'm going to try that now. <laughs> <laughs> Made me intrigued. Um, so thank you so, so much um, for joining us today. Thank you for your time. It's been great to hear from you. And thank you all for listening. Um, stay tuned for more podcasts and keep up to date via our social media at UJS underscore UK.